everybody. My culture, an Indian woman, my family, Bollywood, my education, media, have all had an impact on me, a British Asian woman growing up in the UK in the 70s and the 80s, who didn't quite fit the mould because she had freckles and green eyes, didn't look like all the other Asian people at school, but that's okay, it's nice to be different, it's nice to celebrate our own identity. As I was growing up in a South Asian community, I didn't realise at the time, but actually I'd been socially conditioned by my conditions, or tradition, sorry, from my community, my family and my elders and other people around me. When you watch Bollywood films, you kind of think you're going to live happily ever after. You're going to have 2.4 children. Sadly, for some of us, that isn't the reality. When you're dealt a pack of cards, I've been dealt the Joker a few times. But I also knew the next card for me was always going to be an ace. By the time I was 21, I lost an ovary to cancer. And I was married. My marriage ended because of a lot of different reasons. And actually, it wasn't a fairy tale. People want to control you. They want to oppress you. And you've been told that actually you belong to a good family and we stay in this marriage because actually you've got to uphold the family traditions and the community name in our community. I love being a South Asian woman from Britain and living in Canada, so I have dual citizenship. It's quite funny when I go to India, because actually they think I'm a lottery ticket because I've got two passports. <laughs> but, um, <yeah. laughs> but actually, on a serious note though, as I've been on my knees sometimes in life and been dealt some really difficult choices to make, and kind of look at myself, and I think it's a really good time, because actually I think when you're on your knees you can actually kind of it's the best time to pray. But actually, as I've grown up, I've kind of questioned faith and questioned certain things because actually I've been brought up as a Sikh and a Hindu to learn about karma, that what we put out there is what we get back. So by the time I was 21, I wasn't expecting to be told that actually, you know, that you're never going to be able to probably have children, but you do, but you lost your chances by 50%. So when you've been conditioned by the community, they're probably thinking, well, she doesn't look that bad, you know, she's got the green eyes, but... She can't have children, so she's not good enough anymore. You either sink or you swim. And I've always been a bit fearless. I was brought up in a very loving home. I was brought up with an amazing family, and I had a great sense of self-worth. So when people try to put their values on me because of that's what my community was expecting, I was lucky that my family did kind of have my back. And I'm so grateful, and I'm so blessed, and I'm so lucky to even to this day. They support me with some of the choices that I make. My mother's always losing sleep on my family, though, because I think, oh, my God, you know, here she goes again, and, you know, you've got another fatua coming after her again. But you know what? You've got to stand up for what you believe in. I'm led by my moral compass. And I think when I was growing up in the 80s, because I didn't quite fit in with the Caucasian children, because I wasn't quite fair enough, and then with the South Asian girls, you know, you don't like the oddball. But you know what? You kind of develop your own self-worth. And I've had an amazing life. I'm standing in the very building where I was banging doors down 15 years ago, asking to set up the forced marriage unit. I feel so proud and so honoured to be standing here today as one of the founders of the forced marriage unit. I feel so privileged to be able to support hundreds of children. When I turned 36, of living with years of endometriosis, which is an awful illness if people know about it, and I ended up losing my whole womb. That was a little bit of a very dark time for me because I thought, I held on to hope. I went through surgery after surgery, and I kept thinking, no, I want to have children because I need to have children because I'd been conditioned. I'd been told that this is the way that you're supposed to be. But you know what? I realised that I wasn't destined for that life. I was sitting on a plane flying back from New York and I met somebody really amazing. And they said to me, you have 
the most amazing life. God sometimes takes things away from you because he has different plans for you. Most people can do 2.4 children. Most people can be, you know, give birth to a child, but they don't necessarily mean they're going to be a parent. You supporting children in Africa or in India or wherever else it may be, or even in the UK, and supporting them to end their, to get out of an abusive situation, that is your calling. So I've never looked back 10 years later. And life has been really amazing because I live my life by following my bliss and following my passion. My life calling is, is about standing up for people. It's about, you know, it's okay being different. It doesn't matter, but it's about being fearless. It's about actually standing up to communities whether it's my community or the African community or the Pakistani community, whatever community it is. Because when I, before I'm a feminist or before I'm an Indian woman or before I'm a woman, I'm a human being. And every one of us in this room belong to one race and it's called the human race. And I think sometimes we don't want to focus on that because we think, oh, you know, they belong, they're a bit different. Or, and I kind of think we need to celebrate difference. This is my country. I'm born and raised in this country, and I am so proud of being British. Absolutely love it. I've lived in Canada. I've worked away in other places, but this is where my heart is. I can go back to India on holiday, but that doesn't feel like home to me. I don't really fit in. You know, so when I kind of look at young people now, and they've been feel like they feel so disengaged, they don't feel like they fit in anymore into society. I have to go back and question them and say, well, why don't you feel engaged? Why do you not feel like you belong in the UK? And it's really quite sad because actually, and I go back and talk to whether it's young South Asian children or whether it's white British children up north who would choose to join the EDL or far right movement. And it comes back to sense of belonging People feel like there's no real opportunities for them sometimes, or they don't feel like somebody's going to listen to them. And I say to them, look, I've smashed the ceiling. It's now a floor for the next generation. I sleep, breathe, and live about mentoring the next generation. I'm so passionate about creating real opportunities for the next generation. And recently, I was at the United Nations and I met some lovely people that were there, and Simone being one of them. And that was fabulous, because that was world merit. 360 change makers, young people, come across the globe from 80-odd countries, because they buy into the UN's development goals. There are three people here today that I mentor, Sarav, Kalbia, and Chaya. I've met these people just randomly, they're not related to me in any way. But I could see that they had vision. I believed in them. And then I thought, you know what? I'm in a position of privilege. And if I'm able to open doors for them, then I need to do that. Over the years, I've met many women. And I'll be thinking, well, I've made it to the top. Why should I be helping somebody? <laughs> you know, I worked really hard to the top. And I'm thinking, well, if you know that's what you've gone through, why do you need to be... <laughs> really oppressive. We need to be empowering. We need to be opening doors for the next generation. But one of the things I want to come back to that we need to learn from the past and close the door and move on. Because sometimes in my community, we hold on to certain traditions. I'm not talking about the curry, which is British, Britain's favorite dish or anything like that, or language or anything like that. What I'm talking about is Practices like FGM, like forced marriages, breast dining. You know, and when I meet young children in this country who have gone through something and they think it's their right to passage, they think it's okay. I'll never forget the day when I met this young woman in London at an Amnesty International conference. I was talking about FGM at the time. And she said to me, can you come and meet me in the toilets? And I thought, God, that's a funny blinking request if I've ever heard one. <laughs> Honestly, I did. And, um, but anyway, I thought, okay, let's go. And I started talking to her, and she said to me, have you ever heard of breast dining? 
and do you know what? It's not very often I'm lost for words, but yeah, I was. And she ended up lifting her top up. And I'd never seen anything so horrific. And I'll tell you what shocked me, because I have beautiful nieces, you know, that I love more than life. And, you know, so their body image is so important. You know, when you're a teenager and when you're kind of growing up, you kind of go through so much. And I looked at her and I said, what the hell, what, what's happened to you? And she said, my mum did this because she was worried I was going to get raped. So I won't look attractive. And I, tell, and I was just absolutely horrified. I've spent years supporting disabled people who are also victims of forced marriage and honour-based violence. People are like, are you sure? And I'm thinking, yes. Sometimes there are different motivating factors for those parents. But I think sometimes we all have to take a stand and we have to challenge out-of-date cultural norms. So whether we start thinking that somebody is a little bit different and we start branding them a witch. I've been called that a few times as well, I can assure you. But do you know what? It's, we need to follow our passion. We need to follow our bliss. We need to be led by our moral compass. I want to give you guys to think about something today, actually. I want to call for an action. I want you to become fearless. I want you to take responsibility. And if you are in a position to be able to create an opportunity for a young person, then do that. I love the fact that we are here today and we are here to network. If somebody is standing alone and they seem a little bit shy, go over and say hi to them because I'm sure that we've all got a story to tell. And I also just want to say that, you know, we need to celebrate difference. So whether you don't look like the norm, you look a bit different. I started telling myself many years ago, I sit outside the bell curve, and it's a good little place to be sometimes. Because you know what is normal? It's quite boring, really. And... You know, it's just an amazing venue, and like I just said, it's brilliant to be here all the years later. I'm here always at the forced marriage meetings anyway, but actually to be able to come back here today and talk about issues that are really important to me. And if people want to get involved with the UN Youth and other organisations that I'm linked with, please come back and contact me. I'm on a mission to make London a safe city. We have young people who don't feel safe in London. So if you're a victim of a forced marriage and you've run away from home, you don't have the survival skills. It's a scary place, London. And I kind of want to really make a pledge that if you're able to support violence against women, promote gender equality, then please come and contact me at break because actually... You know, I love meeting like-minded individuals. And thank you, and have a lovely day today.